Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're here on the 5th of September of 2019. Welcome to our show today. Uh, in case you're new, our, uh, new to us, our archives are on uh, Facebook and YouTube, www.facebook.com slash North Star Oasis and youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. Feel free to check out some of our back episodes, and if you like this episode, feel free to watch it again uh, online. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I hope everybody had a great time at the Minnesota State Fair. Uh, that's what we're going to actually start off the show. Now, we cover the State Fair, and we made a comparison contrast with a lot of state fairs across the country last week. So we're not going to make that comparison contrast again. I'm not going to bore you with all those details. We did that last week. No, we didn't bore you last week. That was actually a fun episode. Uh, but nonetheless, we're going to take a look just on uh, the beginning of the show. We're not going to cover the, the entire hour. Um, we're going to take a, a little bit of a look at uh, kind of a wrap-up of the 2019 Minnesota State Fair. Uh, I was there on Monday. We, uh, I missed it last year, so I made it on Monday. Uh, I got my fair out of the way. I'm sure a lot of people did. But, you know, I will have to say that before, before we give you our first clip, you know, two years ago I did not have a good fair experience. I happened to have gone out literally on the most the record turnout day of the, most sing, the single day attendance record in the history of the fair uh, that was set two years ago. And I couldn't move in the street. There were just too many people. And then afterwards, uh, when the temperature dropped and I was at the Alabama concert, uh, I, my uh, core body temperature had decreased as the winds picked up and the temperature cooled. And so I was literally frozen, uh, frozen solid by the time I left. So I had a miserable time two years ago. I did not go last year. And I went this year and I actually had an okay time. Uh, I think taking a year off last year kind of made it a fresher, fair experience for me. Uh, but I actually did enjoy it much more than two years ago. And I think it was because I cho also chose a day that had about 75,000 uh, or 85,000 less, few, uh, fewer people. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the State Fair has been a staple in the Minnesota entertainment diet since 1858 or 1859, since the first one was held at Fort Snelling. I think it was 1859. Fort Snelling. And then... Um, it's been going on pretty much continuous since then, with the exception of a few years where a thing called a war kind of interrupts things. Um, but we haven't had an interruption like that in quite a long time. And in the last 50 years, the Minnesota State Fair has a giant slide, and it just celebrated the half-century mark. So that's where we're going to start off today. We're going to look at the Minnesota State Fair's giant slide and its celebration of 50 years of fun. Grab the tickets. There you go. Have fun. Tickets, please. Tickets. 50th anniversary. <laughs> Always fun up here. Ah, the beauty of the giant slide, towering 50 feet up over Nelson Street, beckoning fair growers young and not so young. How was the slide? Wonderful! <laughs> to lay down $2.50 for five seconds of fun. If the thrill of the slide is part of your fair tradition, you have this man to thank. 50 years ago, Fred Pitroff brought his giant slide to the Minnesota State Fair. No, it doesn't seem that long. The version he brought to our fair was a result of trial and error. His first slide, well, let's just say it was more of a thrill ride. It had just three hubs, and you went across a long flat section then drop way off 15 feet. As Fred puts it, people had trouble with their legs on that one. He didn't elaborate, so let's just say we're happy he leveled it off a bit more at the bottom and added a couple more humps. His daughter Stacy grew up here at the fair. My earliest memories of the slide is I was three and four years old and I would take all my stuffed animals from the midway and I would tie little ropes around their, their paws or whatever I had and I would take them down the slide with me. Met her husband Rob here. He was working at the hamburger stand and he would kind of walk back and forth. And married him at the top of the giant slide. Now we're down to the third generation of running the slide, so it's, it's pretty exciting for us to all be together as a family. As for the slide herself, well, she hasn't aged a bit. And it's in beautiful condition. It's like it's brand new. 
All right, we got our mat. Here we go. Have mat, have friend. Let's go. Still performing her magic 50 years later. I don't like that feeling in my tummy when your tummy drops and the rest of your body stays. And perhaps her best trick of all. I love rides, and um, I can't wait to actually find something bigger. But for now, this is going to do. <laughs> Making us all feel like we haven't aged a day either. <laughs> And thank you for returning to the giant slide. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, the whole so family except fun. for Fred. He didn't want to go down with no. us, but I loved it. It was so much fun. What a beautiful day that was. Oh, we have folks that are heading there directly from this place. Joni and Pam, they're from Hastings. And the reason you have to go there is because it's on her bucket list. Is yes, that right? It's on Joni's bucket list. And, and, you, and you don't like it. I will be okay. <laughs> I was so happy to meet other people that might have a little funny tummy about the slide. You guys got the t-shirts, and you know, they're actually only show, selling these t-shirts this year for their 50th anniversary, so we're lucky enough they dropped a few by. Yes, and thanks for being brave enough, ladies, to admit that you, too, maybe don't love that first feeling, but then it's okay. It's yep. all, he added those two extra bumps so you won't hurt your legs. Yeah, there you go. Which is my favorite part of the whole story. <laughs> all right, enjoy the slide, ladies. Fabulous. Well, this and so there you have it. 50 years of the giant slide. Have you been on the giant slide? Uh, I have to say, I haven't been on it in 32 years. Um, I should do that next year. Um, first time I went to the State Fair was 1987. I was uh, 16 years old. My father took me to the State Fair for the first time. Uh, or was it the year before? It might have been 86. No, it was 87. Well, we missed it in 86. Uh, 1987, I went to the State Fair for the first time. I was 16 years old, and that's when I went down the giant slide. But every time I go to the fair, I go by the giant slide, but I can never go on it anymore. But um, I have to say, it, it, was, it was fun. And I'm just glad to see that a lot of people have enjoyed it for you know, many times over the years. Uh, it's actually, I think, one of the better exhibits and, and rides, attractions, uh, out at the fair. So we're going to take a look right now at what one family did. They actually did a v-blog about their experience at the 2019 Minnesota State Fair. And so we're going to follow them right now. Minnesota State Fair. Yeah. Yes. The largest one by attendance in the country. Really? Yeah. And we're going to go see some baby animals. Yeah, in there. And eat some food. Yep. And all kinds of And do the tilt a while. Oh, we'll see. Thanks, Ray. Right, all right, we'll be back. Venison sticks, prino pups, chicken strips and french fries, fries, cookie dough, and silly cheese curds, and, and a whole bunch donuts. of them. And mini donuts and a whole bunch of them. Oh, the water so, guy. Yeah, we'll be back. That's not a picture. time you're at the state fair in a hail. I usually don't come on days like this. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, it is raining and it's hailing. We are stuck in the pool building. I'm not getting the cheese curds out right now. Dry, I don't know. We'll be back. What do you want? 
you whining about? Because you're wet? Yeah. Yeah. Where's the water? You are not going on a water ride. Just go stand outside. No. I mean, it could be water and dodgeball outside, right? I saw that. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Should we try to get some of All right. Well, at least we're dry for a little bit. Oh, I thought it was okay. From hail? It's your son, you go. Now it's a hot water sweatshirt. But we're going to go try to find a water ride. Right? Every road here looks like that. Completely crowded. Hi. I wish you had a fishing pole. I always wish I had a fishing pole. You can't fish in here. The trout. The Minnesota fish pond. It looks pretty packed over there. <laughs> Where'd your mom go? Can I get in the shoe? She's still in there. You can get in the shoe. Might smell. Giant shoe. Alright, Jules. You're in the big shoe. Get in the shoe, sir. Okay. There we go. Alright. I can't get out. Hey, Matt, let's kayak. Come on, girls. Um, yeah, it comes with big kit. Right? What? That kayak comes with the kid. No? Alright. It has not rained anymore. Looks like it's going to, but it is not. But now we have to go Star Tribune. Just for flavor chapstick. Only reason, flavor chapstick. Last year it was... It was what? Cone. I still didn't hear you. Cone. Cone? Yeah, yeah like a fire like Oh, a like the cone. road cone. Yeah. yeah, it tasted like a cone, like from a road. Oh, it's not available What? Oh, oh no. All right, I think we have to look at the balloon. We can go look at a couple more things. Jules, we're done. We're going home. Yeah. Yeah? Why are we going home? I don't know. Matt has football practice tonight. Miracle birth barn. So we're actually heading out. I have a question for you. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed their family experiences at the fair. I hope that's nothing too unlike yours. Uh, we did cut, a, cut the video a little bit short to come, come back to us simply because I really don't want to see what's going on in a person's house. I, I, I value their privacy that much. If they're going to put something out for the rest of us to see it on YouTube, well, we're gonna, we'll show you the fair stuff, but I, I really don't want their thoughts in the bedroom. That's, that just, that's not this kind of show. Um, the DNR building, that reminded me of something that actually frustrated me. Uh, at the fair on Monday. There was a group there that was actually showing some raptors and you know they were showing different birds and 
they brought in a screech owl. And it's two girls who were walking around with a screech owl uh, on, their, on their forearm. And somebody reached out to pet the screech owl. Now keep in mind that they were doing three shows a day every single day at the fair. That means for 12 days, three times, it's what, 36? 36 opportunities to do this show. And the screech owl comes out. The girl was not paying as close attention as she should have been. No grant the, the guy that. And so he quickly chastised her about paying attention and don't let them do that. Meaning when somebody comes out to pet the bird, they're not supposed to do that. You would think that that would have been fine. Okay, so we got that handled, that nobody's touching the bird and the girl was paying closer attention, and that's fine. But I stood there for the next five minutes as the, as the gentleman presenting was excoriating the audience for reaching out and touching a wild bird. This was the 35th out of 36 shows that he had done. You can't tell me that in the previous 34 that nobody had put their hand out to try to pet, pet a screech owl? Did he do that, you know, excoriate the audience in every one of his shows? I hope not. Um, I, I can understand making it a point right away. Folks, please don't pet the, uh, pet the uh, birds or try to pet the birds because they are wild animals and there's liability issues and, you know, they're scared of you just as much as you'd like to pet them. Bingo, we're done. But no, he spent as much time, actually more time talking about this to the audience in a chastising manner than the amount of time that I've told you this story. He spent longer on that. He spent at least five minutes, and I actually walked away. He, he had given a great presentation up until that point, and at that point in time was when it's like, all right, I, I've had enough uh, of the critical comments of the audience that had already been critiqued ten, you know, five minutes earlier. So that was probably one of the only parts of the state fair that I really did not appreciate this year, and it was the conduct of one person. Uh, and if you're given 35 out of 36 uh, presentations, yes, I can probably guess that you were a little fatigued, so I'll give you a little bit of a leeway for that, but at the same time, you're still in a public forum, you're dealing with the members of the uh, public, and so a little bit more professionalism should have been warranted. But that being said, uh, otherwise it was a pretty good fair, uh, at least for me. I hope it was for you. And it set another attendance record. And we ended last show talking about the attendance records. Now, I still think that Minnesota State Fair ought to really open it up to 14 days instead of 12. I know for some of the exhibitors there, oh, you mean I have to do this two more days? Yeah, sorry. But hey, the Texas Fair is open for a month. And I had uh, I talked to one of the vendors, and they said, you know, we used to have a, sh uh, a store in, uh, in uh, Edina. Oh, by the way, they, they made these shoes or sold these shoes that uh, have springs for the heel. And they're actually pretty comfortable. A little bit on the pricey side, but they were actually pretty comfortable. I'm a guy who, uh, thanks to the United States Air Force, who re-taught me how to walk, I am extremely hard on the heels of shoes. And so my, the shoes that I have don't hold up very well. So I went over to this booth and they had the, uh, the um, shoes that had the spring tension heels. And I kind of like them. But the woman there was saying, yeah, I just, we used to have a store in Edina. Now we only do the fair. We do the 12 days. Uh, I know other vendors here that the moment that we're, we're closed, boom, they're out. They've got the next show to do. And I couldn't even imagine doing Texas because that's a month long. And then there's another uh, stock show in Texas. And that one's uh, about as long, about three weeks. And that actually brings in more... The, the Minnesota State Fair ranks number one per capita uh, based upon the attendance over the number of days. The, um, one of the stock, stockman shows in Texas ranks number two 
overall for the number of people, you know, per capita on the number of days. And number three, of course, is the Texas State Fair for the same reason. But both of those other shows, uh, all three of them take in over two million annually. But the other two shows were for like three to four weeks where Minnesota's not even two. So Minnesotans love their fair and they saw yet another record attendance in 2019. So let's get you up to speed with that. The state fair wrapped up another year with another attendance record. Fair officials say the 2019 edition of the Great, Great Minnesota Get Together finished Monday with a 12 day total attendance of more than 2.1 million thanks to a record Labor Day turnout of 184,740. That beats the previous overall attendance record of more than 2 million set last year. This year's State Fair saw six daily record attendance days. The fair's agricultural and creative competitions drew more than 42,000 entries this year, and the Purple Ribbon, Ribbon livestock, auction, uh, livestock Auction on August 24th, that set 12 new record prices and raised more than $775,000 to benefit youth programs statewide. The 2020 Minnesota State Fair will run August 27th through Labor Day, September 7th. And speaking of all the award winners, did you make it through the fine arts exhibit? There was some fabulous artwork, you know, uh, displayed. I was very impressed with a lot of it. I actually did have one critique. Uh, I disagreed with judges. I can disagree with them all I want. It's not like it'll change the outcome. Uh, the fact is, I thought that the uh, class two sculpture should have been reversed. I think that the number one um, the overall winner of that category should have been number two and the second place category should have been number one. Of course, art and art judging is all subjective and so that's my two cents worth, but I really was impressed with a lot of the work that uh, people had done. Uh, you know, come to think of it, I did not make it to the seed art this year. Now I'm kicking myself for that because I go there, every year I go to the fair, I go to the seed art. And I'm, I'm really thoroughly impressed with the craftsmanship that a lot of people put into their works of art, especially when you're gluing these little tiny pieces of seed. It's like the pointillism uh, type of uh, painting where you're painting in dots, like the RGB dots. And they're very, very, very fine. And I really appreciate when I see some very fine seed artwork uh, done. And I missed that this year. Oh, well. Uh, but again, I really was impressed with the works of art that I saw in the uh, Fine Arts Exhibit. Highly recommend going to the Fine Arts Exhibit when you go there next year. These people are going to blow your mind with their good works. So congratulations to everyone who won an award at the Minnesota State Fair. Even if you are the top overall in, uh, in, in class two sculpture, and I think that you should have gotten the second place ribbon, congratulations nonetheless. Um, now, of course, moving on, we had something that happened uh, not too long after I left on uh, Monday night. Thankfully, I wasn't around uh, and it happened after I had left, but wasn't too far from where I parked and when I was leaving. And that uh, was the chaos that erupted as a, a, a pedestrian uh, hit somebody and there were three people who were shot outside the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. Three people shot outside the fairgrounds. And you're bringing in two million people over the course of 12 days. And yet, somebody got shot outside the fairgrounds. So let's find out what that story's all about in just a moment here, as soon as my producer gets ready. So, Back to our breaking news this morning. St. Paul police are investigating what they call a shockingly brazen shooting outside the state fairgrounds Monday night. Officers say three people were shot just after a woman was hit by a car along Snelling Avenue. Care 11's Alex Hagan is live there with more on the chaotic situation on the last night of the state fair, Alex. Yeah, the last night, Chris and Gia, scary moments here just outside the main gates here behind me here along Snelling Avenue. That's a time when many were leaving the state fair, as you can imagine, causing 
panic as people were hearing those gunshots as they were leaving the state fair. Now, police say this all began when they responded to a pedestrian crash, finding a woman hit by a car on Snelling Avenue. Officers say a fight broke out shortly before she was hit. That woman is fighting for her life in critical condition at a local hospital. Now, shortly after that crash, police say several shots rang out nearby. Officers found a man with a gunshot wound. Police say two other men were shot. All three are expected to be okay. At this time, it is unclear if that crash and the shootings are connected. Now, we did speak with a mom and her two kids who witnessed everything as they were leaving the fair. It's terrifying. He was terrified. He said he's going to have nightmares tonight. Concern for anybody. I mean, there's, you know, this kind of stuff is, you know, has, you know, become too prevalent in this country, and and uh, it's, it was a great run of the fair, so it's a really a sad way for this uh, fair to come to an end. Now, police say the driver of the vehicle who hit that woman is cooperating with police. As for those shootings, they are still searching for suspects. Again, anybody with any information is asked to call police. Back to you. Definitely not the way you expect the fair to end. Alex, thanks for the update this morning. We have a... Uh... And we're going to actually go right now to the police uh, press conference over this matter. We have uh, three incidents I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, it was a busy and chaotic and disappointing night in the city of St. Paul. Uh, it actually happened last night. The first one I'll talk about is a, a homicide, our 15th of the year. A call came in at about 8.30. Um, officers were called to the 1700 block of Ivy Avenue on the east side on a report of a man being shot. When they arrived, they found him. He's an adult male. He was shot in the stomach. He was transported to Regions Hospital. Unfortunately, he succumbed to his injuries at around 9 p.m. Uh, so we had our homicide investigators in for that. We were holding the scene over on the east side. And about an hour later, just after 10 p.m., we got a call about a pedestrian crash right outside the state fair gates. Uh, it was on Snelling Avenue near the intersection with Park Place West. Um, it's about a block and a half, maybe two blocks north of the main gates. I think you all know where that is. Uh, we were, our officers rushed to the scene and they found a, a chaotic scene. There were a lot of people there. They also found a 19-year-old female lying in the street. She was gravely injured. St. Paul Fire Medics were called to the scene. They transported her to Regents Hospital. She's currently in critical condition. Like I said, she's gravely injured. Um, according to witnesses, it seems that there was some fight, some sort of altercation in that area just before she ended up in the street and being struck by the vehicle. The driver of the vehicle initially stopped, um, but he reports that uh, passersby and people in the area started kicking his car and punching his car, so he drove away, found a safe spot, stopped and called 911. He's cooperating with our investigators. They don't report any signs of impairment, but of course there'll be more testing. So while our officers were taking care of that scene, they started blocking traffic back by the main gates on Snelling Avenue. Um, that would be back by Midway Parkway in Snelling, that intersection, right across the street from the main gates. Uh, they were blocking traffic. There were a lot of officers there, and that's when they heard shots ring out. Um, several uh, gunshots are reported, as our officers do. They ran toward the gunfire, A, to look for any victims and make sure they could render aid, and B, to try to find the person or people responsible for the shooting. They didn't find uh, any suspects, but what they did find is an adult male suffering from a gunshot wound. So they started securing that scene. Again, it was very chaotic. It also didn't help that there was a downpour that started uh, shortly after they started um, investigating that incident. Short time later, another adult male showed up at United Hospital suffering from a gunshot wound. He said that uh, he was at outside the gates of the State Fair when he was shot. And then a short time after that, another adult male showed up at Regents Hospital. So we had three people shot. All three were treated and they're expected to survive, thankfully. Um, I can tell you that we have two 20-year-olds. One 20-year-old was shot in the stomach or groin area. The other 20-year-old was shot in the hand. And then we had an 18-year-old who was shot in the shoulder. So that's three people shot in that one incident. We also had the homicide and we had the unfortunate uh, tragic crash involving the pedestrian. So uh, incredibly busy, uh, chaotic night. Um, our officers are working hard, our investigators are working hard. Right now, no arrests have been made in the homicide or the um, shooting outside of the state fair. We're asking for the public's
help anybody who has any video they want to share with us, anyone who knows who's responsible, uh, please give us a call. We'd like to talk to you. Um, that's what I know. That's what I have right now. Um, as these cases move along, more information will, will be put out. Uh, specific to the homicide, we'll ID the suspect after the Ramsey County Medical Examiner has positively identified him and determine an exact cause of death. Um, and there you have it. That's kind of the latest news on that uh, situation. So it's something to keep an eye on. Um, if you happen to know of anybody involved with that, please contact the St. Paul Police Department. As I do know that this show goes into the city of St. Paul, and it is a tragic situation when, you know, regardless of where this happens, it's always a tragic situation. But when you have a family-friendly event, this could have been a major tragedy. And if you know, I'm going to ask you to contact the St. Paul Police Department. That the, whoever did this needs to be made an example. That they need to be held accountable for their actions. And it needs to be swift justice. Uh, if we're going to continue having things like the Minnesota State Fair and other public events without having to have the scrutiny of, a, of an armed force to escort people in and out of the premises, then your help in solving this, pro in solving this case is urgent. It's urgently necessary. I'm going to make the appeal. Uh, if you know any, of anybody involved with this, please stand up and take some responsibility and help the police out in this case. Otherwise, what's going to happen in the future is that you're going to find the state, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the State Fair Board and the St. Paul Police Department and the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department are all going to get together and figure out a new plan of attack to making sure that the Minnesota State Fairgrounds is, is safe. And you're not going to like, I hear so much about Black Lives Matter, you know, the, the protest. Uh, we covered the protest in 2015. They had another one uh, this year at the fair. And if you don't want, if you... You know, I heard about Black Fair. Well, guess what? I saw, you know, this is 2015 when I covered the Black Lives Matter protest. And I heard so many people complaining about, oh, they won't let us into the fair. You know what? I saw at the fairgrounds having a good time. I saw white people, black people, a few American Indians. I didn't see quite as many as I thought I would see. I saw a lot of Latinos. I saw a lot of Asians. I even saw Somalis. And everybody was respectful to each other, and everybody was having a good time. That is the essence of the great Minnesota get-together, the Minnesota State Fair. Everybody is allowed to come in, Republican, Democrat, Constitutional Party, Green Party, Libertarian. Every political persuasion is represented there, and everybody can have a good time. Every ethnicity can be represented there, and everybody can have a good time and get along. And... Uh, same thing, you know, with the whole uh, gay, straight, transgender stuff. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is or how you identify yourself. If you go to the state fair and you have a good time, that's what it's there for. That this is a microcosm of the way society ought to work. That we all can get together and get along and put our differences aside. That's the beauty of the state fair. But then the moment you walk out of the gates, you're in a war zone. And that should not be happening in this city. That's kind of what irritates me. You know, we should not... I've been to Iraq, folks. And sometimes I feel safer in Iraq than I do here, because at least in Iraq I could shoot back. I do not want to see the city of St. Paul become a war zone. And I don't think you want that either. So that's kind of the thing that ticks me off here. And it's not so much for my own personal safety as I happen to have been there that night. It's for the families that, the, that were in the video that we played earlier. The families who go there to have a good time with their young kids. The fair is supposed to be a meaningful experience. And then what happens? They come out to a war zone and have to deal with pedestrian, uh, pedestrians getting uh, hit by cars and then people getting shot. That should not happen in this city. So, again, if you know anybody involved with this, please contact the St. Paul Police Department. We need your help. And I'm not even a cop. I'm going to say, I need your help. Because we can do this together.
Now I'm going to turn the page. We haven't done a Prager University segment in a while. We are actually going to step in about how the government cannot solve a problem. Uh, they do need to solve the shooting in uh, the fair, fairground shooting uh, problem, but they cannot solve the climate change problem, and here's why. Politicians, celebrities, and probably every single person you know at your university or work is talking about climate change. Here's the truth. What's up, guys? This is Will Witt with PragerU. Today, I'm in the beautiful area of Moab, Utah. As you can see, we got the great Colorado River behind us and these fantastic rocks. And it, I felt inspired to make a video about climate change being here today and wanted to basically tell you guys a few things about what's actually going on with this issue, right? Because you're going to hear politicians promise that they want to help save the environment. It's their number one issue, right? With the, you hear it all the time. But when it comes to actually saving the environment or saving the planet, Politicians and government bureaucrats are probably the worst people to do that. Look at the EPA. Just a few hours from here in Durango, about three years ago, the EPA spilled a million gallons of waste into the Animas River. Totally, it was an environmental disaster. This is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, who did this. And think about how they handle the money, right? Look at, look at Germany and how they have an energy crisis because they tried to switch away from fossil fuels and all of that and just use green energy, solar and wind. But then when the winter came around, they realized the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow and energy costs in Germany went way up. And then look at America with under the Obama administration with a company like Solyndra that spent $500 million on research for solar power and went bankrupt and did nothing, right? This is what happens when you let government officials handle the environment. And even, by the way, when we're talking about major countries who are polluting the ocean and polluting the world, America doesn't even come close as to one of those top countries. And I totally believe in climate change. A lot of people give me flack for it. I think it's real. I think that sea levels have been rising faster once the Industrial Revolution started. And I think that humans play a part in this. Even though the climate has always been changing, there are things that we as humans can do. But here are a few things that you might not know. When Al Gore said that polar bears were going to be extinct um, by this time, there are actually more polar bears now than when Al Gore made those claims. Or did you know that there are actually more trees in the Northern Hemisphere than there were 100 years ago? There are already so many things that are going on in America and across the world to help the environment. Things aren't getting nearly as bad as your politicians want you to believe. The free market sector is where the environmental solutions will come from. I was just watching this video the other day that these people took trash and they turned it into disposable cutlery for people to buy you know, plates and forks and stuff. And that's the free market with an environmental solution. Or think about the flash drive, which was not invented by some government agency, but was invented by the free market and has saved millions of trees because you no longer have to carry papers around. You can put your files on a little hard drive. Just the other day I heard one of the greatest stories about the free market helping climate change that I think I've ever heard. It was about a company that made stoves for third world countries. If you didn't know, four million people die every year from respiratory diseases from stove smoke in these third world countries. And so this company basically made stoves that didn't emit nearly as much smoke and helped save lives, and then they sold it to these people in third world countries. So the people at this company were actually able to sell the stoves to these people in these poor third world countries for less than they were able to make it. And they could then sell carbon credits to wealthy investors to invest in the company. This is why they were able to do that. And also the workers who were making these stoves were people in Africa who were then getting job experience and being able to, to gain skills. And so this company, one company, has helped eliminate smoke from the environment, given people jobs, saved lives, and made people money, all at the same time. This is what the free market can do. You don't find this kind of innovation within the, the public sector, within the government, because they don't know how to spend your money as well as you do. And another example is Ecosia, which is a search engine similar to Google, and they use all their ad revenue that they make off of the search engine to then go plant trees across the world. This is a beautiful thing. This is a free market. This is capitalism at work, saving the environment. And so, you guys are going to see all these politicians and celebrities talk about saving the environment while they ride around their private jets, basically polluting the environment and virtue signaling to get your votes and for you to get them to love them. But there are real practical solutions that business people across the world are doing that we should be focused on and that we should be pursuing ourselves if we really care about helping the environment. So if you want to protect a beautiful place like this, Moab, all the other places in America that need to be preserved, that have beautiful animals and landscape and wildlife, Think about the free market the next time you think about climate change. I know that that is the best solution to doing anything to save this planet. Well, with for PragerU, thank you. Of course, now I know I got a little, you know, a little heated in my rhetoric about the uh, state fair uh, shooting, and so that 
of course, led me to forget to make a proper setup for the video that you just saw. Uh, last night was a uh, was the CNN Climate Town Hall, where 10 Democrat presidential candidates presented their plans for tackling climate change in a seven-hour CNN Town Hall on global warming. I'm going to tell you, I did not watch this. I was not going to listen to 10 Democrats telling you or telling me how wrong I am for living uh, because I need to be more concerned about the climate than I am about how I'm going to pay for lunch. Uh, so I did not really want to you know, watch it for that reason. Plus, seven hours watching CNN. Can't even stand seven My producer can't even stand seven seconds anymore. I could probably go about maybe a minute and seven seconds, but that's about it. Um, but you know, in, all, in all seriousness, I did not need to hear politicians, even Republican politicians for that matter, if they were invited, I did not need to hear politicians talking about the climate for seven hours. And if you've watched the show for any length of time, we have covered the climate quite a bit. And we have shown through science some differences of opinion and some different facts from what the Democrat and Republican politicians have to say. And yes, I am saying the Republican politicians like Mitt Romney, who has bought into this uh, climate hype in the past. But anyhow, New York Times, they have uh, five takeaways from the Democrats' climate town hall. I'm just going to read you the headlines. I just pulled the story up. I don't even know what, what they're saying here. So this is going to be uh, news to both of us. Uh, Cory Booker says every policy should be informed by climate change. Uh, he said, it is the lens through which we must do everything. Well, I'm going to just kind of leave that hanging. Beto O'Rourke, well, this is a guy who's never going to be president, uh, revives cap and trade idea for carbon emissions. Uh, under such a system, the government issues a limited number of allowances or permits to companies and other entities that emit carbon dioxide. Or I'm thinking that in... Uh, O'Rourke's $5 trillion climate plan, that's costly, uh, I figure that O'Rourke is probably going to be making a lot of money along with Al Gore who profited the last time we had cap and trade. Uh, Pete Buttigieg calls climate change a kind of sin. Um, quote, the real conversation we've got to have is about what's at stake here beyond the traditional battle lines that have been drawn. If you believe that God is watching, what do you think God thinks of that? No, what, if you believe that God is watching as humanity spews pollutants, what do you think God thinks of that? Uh, this is less and less about the planet as an abstract thing and more about a pe specific people suffering specific harm because of what we're doing right now. And at least one way of talking about this is that it's a kind of sin. Um, if Pete Buttigieg is going to start talking about sin and he needs to take a look at his own lifestyle and how that goes against uh, what God actually has said through the scriptures. But I'm not going to judge. God's going to judge. And so Pete can be the Buddha judge. So now the next is... Uh, oh, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. You don't want to know what they stand for, Senator Amy Klobuchar said after ticking off acronyms for three conservation programs. Uh, at times, the candidates and their interrogators dove into the weeds, providing an alphabet soup of chemical compounds, federal programs, and shorthand. So let's define some terms. CRP, CSP, and EQIP. E -Q -I -P. These are three programs administered by the United States Agricultural Service, named by Ms. Klobuchar. The Conservation Re uh, Reserve Program pays agricultural producers to replace crops on environmentally sensitive land with plants that would improve environmental quality. The Conservation Stewardship Program pays and provides technical assistance and, uh, to participating farmers for conservation performance. And the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP, helps farmers and landowners address natural resource concerns. Uh, I think we're going to kind of leave it at that. And then I'm going to finish it up with Elizabeth Warren says talk of light bulbs and straws is a distraction. Um, or for that matter, Elizabeth Warren doesn't want you to get distracted by light bulbs. Or for that matter, paper versus plastic straws. Or whether the Green New Deal will take your cheeseburger away. 
oh, come on, give me a break, the Massachusetts senator said at a CNN climate forum. Uh, this is exactly what the fossil fuel industry hopes you're all talking about. They want to be able to stir up a lot of controversy about your light bulbs, around your straws, and around your cheeseburgers. When 70% of the pollution of the carbon that we're throwing into the air comes from three industries. Well, uh, three industries contributing the most carbon dioxide emissions in the United States right now, Ms. Warren noted, are the building industry, the electric power industry, and the oil industry. So if you happen to be in the construction industry, you are being targeted by Elizabeth Warren. So I am actually going to leave it at that. I think we've heard enough about the uh, politicians talking about uh, climate change, but I am going to add with this. Can we actually have a serious scientific discussion about the merits of climate change and how things are cyclical and how it doesn't really matter what the politicians want you to not do anymore? It's not going to have a bearing in the environment. Oh, wait a minute. We actually can have that discussion, and here's why. Because we have people already talking about that. And with that, we are going to go with Joe Bastardi from Weather Bell Analytics. And we haven't played a Joe Bastardi clip in a while. We're actually going to be playing two of them. The first one is an interview he had on Blaze TV where he discusses more in the climate sphere of his research and his work. As a meteorologist, I, have, I do have to deal with the planet being warmer. But what they don't tell you is where it's warming and when. It's mostly warming up in the Arctic regions during their winter. You know, and so what they do is they put the Earth's on fire. They have all these red colors. Yeah. It's 0.2, for instance, the month of July, hottest month on record, people say. It's 0.3 Celsius above the 30-year running average. All that means is that there was enough warm air to outduel the cold air, like the record cold you had in Russia. No one said boo about that, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they'll run to Greenland and they'll run to Europe. Right? Oh, it's warm over here, or DC's having a heat wave. But they won't tell you there's countering cold all over the place, right? Mm. And that countering cold is a sign that the atmosphere is fighting back. 2013, if I could have, if I could have wrestled the way I talk, I would have been national champion. <laughs> 2013, we heard about the perma drought coming, mm -hmm. right? Remember after the hot summers in Texas and California? What happened? The exact opposite thing happened that they forecast. And I'll tell you why that happened. What they were anticipating happened is a large ridge of high pressure would expand over the United States. The summers would get progressively hotter. And what happens is with the increase in water vapor in the air due to the oceans warming, and the oceans, the oceans warm cyclically. They don't just, uh, well, CO2 is warming the ocean up. So what happens is water vapor comes in the air. If the atmosphere was warming significantly, it just be warmer, more humid, and dry. Instead, it's raining a lot, which means there's resistance going on. And then you look over the tropics. The reason why the, the tropical, the, what we call the ACE index, is not uh, um, increased globally is because the air is drying out over the tropics. Mm -hmm. That's opposite of what they were predicting. People don't even understand this. How is it? it, it okay, I'm, I'm well aware when I make mistakes in what I do. But in 2013, my company came out and said, this looks like 52 through 54, which are brutally hot in Texas and dry, all right? And it's going to reverse within two or three years. Sure enough, by 2016 and 17, it reversed, same way it reversed in 57, 58, mm. right? The same, you saw what happened. So here's, here's why I'm involved with this. The atmosphere is an infinite majestic system that no man can possibly keep up with. It is the greatest teacher of humility that there is. So what you do is you go back and you look at what happened. And so when something shows up, like Sandy, okay, mm -hmm. October 21st, I started emailing the people of Fox and my clients that this was going to come up. Why did I know that? It, wasn't, it was just a tropical wave at that Why time. Why weren't you emailing right? Sarah? Well, yeah. <laughs> Why did I know that? Awesome. Because I had the maps from Hurricane <laughs> Hazel from my dad telling me to look out for this, this kind. He used to always call, talk about shortcut storms coming into the mid-Atlantic states. You know, Hazel roared up the coast as a Category 4 in October of 54. Or Harvey. Everybody's staring at the eclipse on August 21st. Harvey's a tropical wave in the Western Caribbean at the time. We're warning our te uh, clients on the Texas Gulf Coast about it. How did I know that? It's not, it's not magic, and it's not that I'm smart. It's just that the foundation you stand on today was built yesterday to reach for tomorrow. So even though that was an abbreviated uh, interview, the fact is there's a lot of science out there. There are a lot of models to look at. There are a lot of 
things that go in cycles. And yet, as Joe Bastardi points out, we talk about the warm, 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 but never the cold, except in like February. Oh, it's record cold, so that must mean it's global warming. And it's, it's, it really, the cold means it's really warm. Well, I guess Al Gore was right when he said everything that's up, that should be up is down, and everything that's, that should be down is up, because that's exactly what he's made it into. And, and the whole climate gate and climate, you know, this whole climate nonsense is taking the stuff that we know is right and flipping it. That's what these guys are doing. And it's because of a political narrative and not a scientific one. And, I, and yeah, that, that quote uh, actually might have actually been um, stolen from the Bible. Now, I have to say stolen because it, it would have been known as scripture twisting, you know, taking it to mean a context other than in which it was meant. But nonetheless, um, hurricanes happen. Polar vortexes happen. Weather happens. Now, I hear, of course, the... Uh, naysayers on the far left, well, you know, you can't make a correlation based upon the weather, except that they do that all the time to prove their point. Well, you know what? It was a record high in International Falls this winter. So therefore, we have global warming. But then if you point out that, yeah, uh, a year ago we had uh, record cold, oh, well, well that, that, throw that one out. That doesn't prove our hypothesis. That's not that, that does not bring in credibility to the arguments, but that's exactly how the left operates. So this whole seven-hour debate, I did not want to hear that because I want to, if I'm going to hear seven hours of lectures, I'll go on to YouTube and I will watch scientists debating this for seven hours and find a whole lot more use than the crap I would have heard last night on CNN. Nonetheless, we do have a major hurricane that is about ready to impact the United States. Now, if you've been watching the news and the weather, uh, first it went through the Bahamas, and I'm talking about Hurricane Dorian, and it hit the Bahamas really, really hard. And President Trump did say that the U.S. is helping the Bahamas with Hurricane Dorian recovery. Um, it's been a catastrophic trail of destruction. So if you feel that compelled to help out in any way. I'm sure there's plenty of opportunities to do so. But the people in the Bahamas need your thoughts, prayers, and your support, including some money, to be able to rebuild, just kind of like we've had with uh, Puerto Rico a year ago. Nonetheless, Joe Bastardi accurately predicted where this was headed, and he said it was going to come through the Bahamas. He said it was going to strengthen as it moved westward, but then it was going to weaken as it, as it paralleled the coast of Florida. And because of the curvature of Florida, it is not going to make landfall in Florida. And he has predicted for almost a week that it's going to make landfall uh, in North Carolina. So now we are going to take a look at Joe Bastardi discussing Hurricane Dorian and whether it will intensify before it reaches the coast. This came out yesterday, on Wednesday. Meteorologist Joe Bastardi, weather or not, and we're going to see whether or not Dorian is going to intensify coming to the coast. I think it is, and I will explain my reasons. Uh, first of all, here's our track this morning, calling for a, a cat landfall category one through two. I now think it'll be two or three, and it'll be a two or three out there. And uh, the reason is, uh, this is now beginning to move over the warmer water, and uh, that's one thing. And there's another thing, I'm going to get to the map, and I'm going to show you this little trick here, forecasting trick, okay, as to why this may uh, deepen coming to the coast. It has nothing, it has as much to do with global warming, it intensifying coming to the coast, as the 55 millibar weakening that it had, okay? In other words, nothing. All right, I'm going to show you the reasons. Now, here's where I think, uh, I, I think uh, Dorian will be worse than uh, Florence and Matthew here, and in, in this part of North Carolina, Florence will win in here. So I don't, I don't think this storm is as bad as Florence in here, but I think it's worse than Florence and Matthew up here and down here. Um, here's the uh, cloud, uh, excuse me, the radar shot, and you can see, uh, the, uh, the eye is becoming more and more concentric here, not eccentric, concentric. Here's the cloud shot. Now, let me, let me uh, use this to, um, to try to make my point. 
This is going to be moving almost directly at Charleston till it gets to about right here. All right. And what happens is, especially at night, it, the air over land tries to blow toward the water, right? See? Tries it because it cools over the land at night. And it's very, very strong uh, be, uh, out over the water from uh, almost the isobaric direction. But that causes convergence. There's added convergence as this comes to the coast. So what will ha what happens, you saw your classic case was Hugo. Um, uh, you go deep in 25 millibars coming to the coast and tightened up. Now, I, I think this is going to deepen down into the mid-950s. I could see the 940s because late tonight, if everything just gets in line, the pressure is going to fall. Remember, there's, there's two rules here. The one has to do with the convergence. That's why if you ever watch, there's always thunderstorms offshore here in the morning in the summertime. There's, there's uh, late night, early morning thunderstorms because the cooler air is trying to come off land. So there's, there's a, a, an area of natural convergence because of the way the coastline is shaped. So it comes toward the coast. But the other thing is it's moving now. And the, uh, you know, the old timers rule uh, for uh, prime uh, speed for intensification is 8 to 16 miles an hour. Now, why is that? Because if it's under 16, there's generally pretty low shear. All right. It's not like, uh, you know, moving westward 25 or 30. All right. The other thing is, if it's moving more than eight, it's coming over fresher, warm water. It's not the water's upwelling, but mainly from the storm behind it. So it's getting a new source of energy. So that convergence and the uh, idea that it's moving now is going to make it very interesting. I think it's going to get to within uh, oh, 20 miles of Charleston. And then the stronger it gets, now this is, it, this is interesting too. Everything's interesting to me. Uh, the stronger it gets, the more it will try to bounce off the coast. Because remember, it doesn't. The, the, the enhanced convergence is right in here, right? It's not over the land. So it could come right up in here and then go around Cape Romaine, which may go around Cape Fear. Finally, when this coast turns straight east is when it may try to go in completely. Now, I, I do think it's going to brush this, brush Cape Fear, brush Cape Lookout, go inside Hatteras, and then out. And there's still the little debate about New England. I, again, they're going to have a, a, a nor'easter in Providence and Boston. They're going to have tropical storm conditions in southeast New England. Uh, and, you know, if this thing comes 100 miles further north, then you're talking about the Cape and Nantucket and Martha's, Martha's Vineyard. All right. So it'd be cool if I could get a phone call from President Obama. So, Joe, how about coming out here and at this juncture riding out the storm? <laughs> nope. <laughs> no one will invite me to the Hamptons or Martha's Vineyard. That's it for now. Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. Okay, so there's uh, Joe Bastardi. Now what we're going to do is look right now at uh, Hurricane Dorian. Uh, this is what it was looking like an hour ago. And if you see right there, as Joe Bastardi said, right off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina. And the winds are picking up and... Uh, it still hasn't made landfall yet, but it looks like it's close, but it's in that convergence zone. And any second now, we should actually have a wind map coming up. And there it is. And if you take a look to the South Carolina coast, you can see the way the winds are moving because of the hurricane. Now, if you take a look closer to International Falls, Minnesota, just north of us, you will find in the wind map from 1.24 p.m. Central Time, there is a low pressure system somewhere around Hibbing, between Hibbing and International Falls. And so the uh, wind is moving that way, but then there is, again, to the uh, southeast, you have Hurricane Dorian, and you take a look at the intensity and the direction of those winds, which is exactly what Joe Bastardi had just told us. Anyhow, for Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding there's 110 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.